Um, my name is Brian McNamara, and I'm a professor in uh, the Department of Physics and Astronomy here at the University of Waterloo. Uh, and it's my pleasure to welcome Professor Carl Gebhardt uh, from the University of Texas. Um, before I do that, though, uh, I would like to thank the Faculty of Science for their support in putting on this event, in particular uh, Heather Neufeld and her team uh, for organizing this, as well as our department chair, Jeff Chen. Um, Carl uh, came to us from Texas. He is currently the Herman and Joan Suit Professor of Astrophysics at the University of Texas at Austin. Um, Carl received his master's degree from Michigan State in 1991. Uh, following that, he went to Rutgers to work on his PhD in astrophysics. Uh, and in 1994, uh, he was a postdoctoral fellow at the University of Michigan. Uh, in 1997, he then went off to the University of California at Santa Cruz uh, to take a Hubble Fellowship. And in 2000, he was recruited to the University of Texas at Austin for a professorship. But Carl is known uh, for many things, um, primarily his studies of, of dark matter uh, and energy in galaxies. Uh, but he's probably most noted for uh, a really remarkable discovery, uh, his part in that discovery of um, Two things, actually. One is that essentially all massive galaxies harbor massive nuclear black holes in their in, in massive black holes in their nuclei. And when I say massive, I mean millions to well over a billion solar masses at the center. Um, if that's not remarkable enough, he played a key role in discovering that regardless of the mass of the galaxy, the black hole was about one seven hundred or so of the mass of the galaxy itself. And this was a remarkable discovery because the black hole, as large as it is, billion solar mass black hole, compared to the size of the galaxy, is tiny. And somehow the galaxy and the black hole at the center of the galaxy seem to know each other or know about each other. And this has sparked an enormous industry of research over the last decade and a half. And Carl has been at the center of that. And he's going to talk about that tonight. And so uh, I'd like to welcome Carl Gebhardt from the University of Texas. Hello, everyone. Um, so thank you for coming out. And uh, what I would like to do tonight is talk to you about uh, dark things in the universe. And uh, this is one, this is, this is my major avenue of research. Uh, and it's been very, very exciting over the last, say, decade. And one thing, one thing I want to get to you tonight is, is right now is, is an unbelievable time in terms of astronomy. We are learning so much so fast, and it's changed so much and so fast in terms of the black hole constant in the universe and the impact on galaxies. In terms uh, of, of how, what the dark matter is, the dominant component of matter in the universe. And then in terms of this unbelievable, this mystery we have on the expansion of the universe. Uh, and, and where it's going and where it comes from. All these things are related. So uh, what, what I want to do is talk to you about all these dark things, black holes, dark matter, and dark energy, place them in context for how we do it, and then where we're going from here and why we do this. So I have some, some, some eye candy shots up here for you. Um, one of the um, um, large projects I'm doing is to, is to use this telescope here. This is the Hobby Eberly Telescope. This is our large telescope. It's a 10 meter telescope we have out in West Texas. And we are modifying this telescope here to do a very significant survey of how the universe expands over time. And I'll, I'll, I'll tell you why we need to do that. Uh, and it's just, it's, it's understanding where we're going, where, 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 what the galaxy, how the universe evolves over time, and it ties back in to where it comes from. So we are doing a major modification of this telescope right now. We took it down about a month ago, and we're doing a major upgrade here. Uh, the top plot up over on the right is a, um, an artist's rendition. I, 
I work with her in terms of what it might look like around one of the more massive black holes that are out there in the universe in trying to understand how the stars are distributed uh, so, and how fast they are going. And I'll show some examples of why that's important. The one on the left is kind of a nice uh, sh a shot. It's what, it's, it's what you would see if a black hole were relatively close to us. You would see these remarkable distortions. So here's the Milky Way, our Milky Way, a galaxy in the background. And here are the distortions of what, uh, what one would have. So this is, um, um, it's mimicking a black hole that's about 10 times the mass of the sun um, at about the distance of the moon. And it will look fantastic for like one second and, and, and then we would all die. But, <laughs> but I think for that time it would be pretty phenomenal. So l let me talk about what we're doing and put it in the big picture for um, um, what we want to do as astronomy. We're just trying to understand from how, how the matter is distributed in the universe extremely early on to how we get to now. We want to understand where the universe comes from, how that matter collects uh, quite early on, how you make a galaxy, how you make a star in that galaxy, how you make a planet in that, around that star, and then how you make a life um, on that planet. That's, that's, that's in a nutshell, what, what we do as astronomers. And what I have here are two pictures. The top picture is a baby picture of the universe. So this is um, a picture from the Planck satellite. This is the cosmic microwave background. If we were to go out at the night sky and we had cosmic ray eyes, cosmic ray vision, um, uh, <laughs> cosmic ray, uh, um, uh, so, microwave, so microwave vision, what we would see, it would look like this. Uh, these are hot spots and cold spots. These are cold spots in the universe, and these are hot spots in the universe. These are indicative of how the mass is distributed early on in the universe. Since we're looking back in time, and this is a very, this is 13 and a half a billion years ago, since we look back in time, we're seeing the universe, and, and since the universe expanded dramatically in that time, we're seeing the universe at very extremely small, on the size of of an atom. So this is on atomic scales inside. So this is how, how the matter is distributed on atomic scales. Then we expand over time. And what we're looking at in the bottom plot here is an image of the universe um, if you removed all the stars. We go out at night, and when you look up, you see stars everywhere um, I'm out there. Um, and for us, for, for us who observe the galaxies, the stars are just in the way, they're kind of a nuisance. Uh, so, so if we could magically remove the stars, so this is how the galaxies are distributed. So our idea is to try to understand how you go from this structure here, the very small, when the universe was very small, to how you make the galaxies along here. So that's the basic idea here. So I want to walk you through that process and then, and then talk about the relationship with uh, black holes and dark matter. Um, and so let me, let me tell you how we do it in practice. So this is, we, we, you know, we often compare th theory to observations. So on the left is a theoretical simulation of how the matter is distributed in the universe. On the right is the actual observations. So let's think of observations uh, to begin with, and what you see are these are galaxies. So this is like a very um, a detailed model from uh, what's called the APM survey of where galaxies are in the universe. And if we zoom into a particular point here, we get a galaxy. Here's the famous one a lot of us probably know. That's the Sombrero galaxy. Looks like a nice Sombrero. Um, and if you zoom all the way in with an HST image, an image from the Hubble Space Telescope, you get the region right near to the black hole. There's, there's a black hole in the middle of this galaxy as uh, um, as we discovered not too long ago, that effectively every galaxy that has a sizable uh, component to what, what's called a bulge, a rounded component here, has a black hole. That tells us something about how the galaxy evolves. And if you take an HST image here, you zoom in on the black hole, you can never, we can't see the black hole yet. There uh, are people here who are working exactly on that problem. But you see a dot of light right there. That's, that's, that is activity around the black hole. That is a gas that is running into itself and it's emitting light. And that's what we see at that point here. But that's indicative of the black hole. On the left is the simulation that we want to try to get right to understand 
how we get the image on the right. So what we have on the left is, is a model where you start out with a smooth uh, distribution of material, you let the universe expand, and then you turn on gravity. And you just have it evolve for a long time, and structure begins to form. You begin to get this beautiful structure here. If you zoom in here, you can see what are called walls and filament and filaments, and you get these voids here. The gravity tends to attract, and it, it, it tends to clump up. And inside there, then you begin, to, you begin to see a giant a galaxy. This is the galaxy here, and you zoom in here, and this is how a large uh, a galaxy uh, appears. The problem is, on the left, what you're looking at is the dark matter, and on the right, what you're looking at is the normal matter. I'll explain that in a moment. And so what we want to do, well, so let me place, place in context of, of, of what I'm going to talk about in, um, uh, this evening. On the smallest scales, we have the black hole. The black hole is an attractive force. It's just an object where a gravity has run away. Uh, I'm, I'll, I'll, I'll come back to that. And it, it's, it's, a gravitational for, it's a gravitational attraction, so the material wants to orbit about it. So it wants the material to, to, uh, to orbit in that sense. A dark matter is material that is, is distributed around the galaxy. Okay, when you look at a galaxy, what we look at are the stars. That's a normal matter. That's what we're going to call a normal matter. The dark matter is in a large halo around the galaxy, and that, what we think, is a new type of particle, and it's just an attractive force as well. When you go on to bigger scales, then you get into something which we have no idea about called dark energy, and that um, actually has an opposite, uh, it has an opposite uh, a force. It tries to push the galaxies apart from each other. So black holes and dark matter attract, as far as we can tell, and dark energy uh, pushes everything apart. Okay, so can, let me explain here's the problem. I'll put it all in context now in this pie chart, and you probably have seen a similar pie chart to what the energy content, the matter content is in the universe. And one of the basic things we ask ourselves is what is in the universe when you try to solve some system, you know, like how does the human body work? How does uh, an engine work? How, what's, you know, what's the constituents of the oceans? You know, you need to know what the fundamental base constituencies are. And as far as we know, so this is what we have here. So we have normal matter, the stuff that we know and love, the stuff that we are made of. Okay? That is a relatively small fraction of about 5%, or 4 or 5%. Um, and that, even the normal matter, is distributed in this fashion way. It's mainly hydrogen and helium. Okay? The stuff that we know, the heavy elements, what's on Earth and in our bodies, is a really small fraction, about 0.03%. Right? Dark matter, we know, is about 21% of the total energy budget in the universe. Um, dark matter had been, still is, a problem for quite a long time now. We think what the dark matter is is just an elementary particle that has yet to be discovered. Maybe in the Large Hadron Collider we'll get some, some indication of what that dark matter particle is. Uh, that's, that's possible. But we haven't seen it yet. We haven't been able to grab that particle yet. But we know that it's about that amount of mass. We know that from a variety of, uh, of observations out there. So when we, when we talk about the major component of matter in the universe, it's the dark matter and the baryons, the normal matter, the stuff that we are made of is a really small component. And then you have this big chunk here, this big blue uh, chunk of uh, dark energy. This we are pretty much clueless on as to what a dark energy is. And we only know it in terms of how the universe is expanding. And I'll, I'll come back to that in a little bit. Um, but this is about 74% of the energy. So one thing that effectively, every time I look at this pie chart here, I'm always amazed. We have 95% of the stuff in the universe is, is in quantity that we don't know. I mean, that, that is great for job security, for astronomers, <laughs> but it's, 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 it's really an embarrassment that we are at this point where, you know, we, we come up here and we talk to you about the universe is 13.7 billion years old, 
um, that light, that um, the cosmic microwave background was, was emitted um, uh, uh, 13 and a half uh, a billion years. Then we start to talk to you about how we make a galaxy, and then we talk to you how we make a star, a planet, et cetera, and we don't know what 95% of the universe is. Um, so, so either you think we are pretty good at what we do, or you'd be really skeptical and, you know, be, and, 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 and be concerned. Um, but anyway, so, so let me talk about what the base ideas are of, of what this stuff is, and then how we're going to solve this problem. Okay, so the best explanation. Okay, so black holes is that you get mass so concentrated that we know of no force that can stop the gravitational infall, or the, it's, it's actually it's the warping of space-time, space-time effectively folds in on itself, that, that it gets so strong that uh, nothing can escape. You effectively, to, to escape from a black hole, you have to go faster than the speed of light. And since you can't do that, according to Einstein and according to everything that we have seen, um, um, that's the definition of a black hole. It's, our theory breaks down. This is one of the areas where string theory has tried to make a lot of inroads. Uh, it's a very difficult topic. We haven't been able to get too far in it. Um, and what is probably going on on the inside is probably, it's probably not uh, like any Star Trekky exotic type things that it's a porthole to another type of dimension or all these things happen. It's probably some new state of matter that we just haven't been able to write down mathematically yet. It's probably something as boring as that, but maybe it is a portal to another. That would be great. Um, and, it's, and it's lots of fun to theorize as well. I mean, this is it's the stuff that Hollywood is made of. Um, so dark matter, the problem of dark matter is that the, the idea has been around for 70 years. And I would say 99% of, 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 of scientists um, argue that a dark matter is this new type of particle. And I've been saying for like the last four years that within a year we're going to have strong evidence that, the dark that we found the dark matter particle. Hasn't happened yet, so I'm going to say in two years we're going to have strong evidence of, of when that dark matter particle happens. Um, we, are, we are extremely close. There are so many dark matter particle experiments based on the astronomical observations and the physics observations in the lab. We're making some pretty, we, we, are, we are narrowing down where that dark matter particle lives and we have some really fantastic experiments ongoing now. Okay, dark energy has been around, the idea has been around for 10 years or so and um, it's, it's causing galaxies, this, the separation of galaxies to, to increase. This is just, I mean, the, the only consensus is that we have a major problem here, is that we, 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 we don't understand what is going on. It may be a property of space, maybe that we don't understand how gravity works, or maybe that we have to modify fundamentally the Big Bang model. That, I mean, what, I think whatever it is, it's probably a profound answer in terms of what is in the universe. Um, this is an area where the theorists have, 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 have failed. I'm an observer, so I can say that quite strongly. So this is an area where I would argue the observations need to come to the rescue to pin down more accurately the parameters of what dark energy may be, and then we'll go back to the theory and try to narrow some things down. Okay, so that's the big context. Let me try to, to delve into a couple of the details. What I want to do is walk you through how we measure these things. Dark, uh, black holes, dark matter, and dark energy, as far as we can tell, are not related physically. Okay, um, but the techniques for measuring them are going to be very similar. And that's where I come in. Um, uh, so to measure these things that you can't see, you have to use objects that are orbiting around them or near them or th through them, and then you can tell what that is. So let me explain how that goes. Um, it's just how everything moves. Here is a picture of a galaxy. This is one of my favorite galaxies. This is the galaxy M87. It's one of the more um, a massive galaxies in our nearby universe. Uh, it has a black hole, it has a jet coming out of here. Uh, this has a really strong chance of having its event horizon being measured. Let, let me make one caveat about black holes. Um, I, I say the word black hole, and we all say the word black hole, not, well, maybe not all of us, uh, but you've seen it in, in, in Hollywood and it's in the, in the press. I, we have no evidence that black holes actually exist. 
When you call something a black hole, it's a very specific entity where you have this, this event horizon, that this is point of no return, this, this, this spot where space-time is curved in on itself. And what we've only been able to do so far is measure them on a mass in a certain, um, in a certain radius. And what we're ending up with is, is, is none of the above, that everything we try to, that, uh, that, uh, that everything we try to model um, as having so much mass and such a small volume, it, it just, it, it can't sustain itself, it collapses it on itself, and so we can't have a model yet, we don't have a model yet, a theoretical model, I mean, other than everything collapsing and that would be a black hole. Okay, so what you simply do is you just measure how fast the stars are moving around the black hole, so there's a black hole I'm in the middle here, we can't see it in this image, this is a beautiful HST image, uh, you just measure how fast uh, they're moving, and Newton told us how to, how, to, how to figure out why they're moving that fast, and this is a simple equation here, the mass is equal to how far away it is times the square of how fast it's moving. It's that easy. Um, so what you do in practice is you take a spectra, and what you do is you put like a grid over the galaxy, and you ask yourself how fast the star is moving here, 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 here. You take all this, all the information in here, all the light, and you put it through what is effectively a prism. You divide the light into its individual uh, wavelengths, much like a rainbow, and you look at how fast the stars are moving um, in that, uh, from that image. And so then you, you do that for the whole thing. This is what's, what we call an integral field unit, an IFU. That's, that's, my, that's my observation, that's my uh, instrument of choice. That's what you do. The same thing for dark, so that's how you do black holes, and you're gonna see it's the same thing for dark matter. But for a black hole, you wanna see how fast the stars are moving relatively near to the center. For dark matter, you wanna see how fast they are moving at the edge of the galaxy, and you do the exact same thing. It's the same instrument, and you just put it, one you point in the middle of the galaxy, one you point on the edge of the galaxy, and you see how fast they are moving, and then the stars are moving faster because there's often uh, a dark matter halo around the galaxy. The dark matter tends to be all around the galaxy, whereas the normal matter is clustered in the center of the galaxy. Okay, and then for dark energy, now you go on even larger scales, and what you do is here is an, a, a very a deep image of the universe, and now what you look at is how fast these galaxies are moving away from each other. Because what dark energy is doing, it's actually causing an extra um, an extra bit in the expansion of the universe and it's causing the separation between the galaxies to increase faster than what we had generally thought. So again, you take your spectrograph and now you measure how fast each of these galaxies are moving and then you make a mass and then you make a model of that and then you can tell what the dark energy is. So again, it's all the same observations, effectively the same observation, it's seeing how fast things move and then you infer what is causing that motion um, I'm after that. Okay, so let's come back to black holes and then I'll, I'll walk our way out. So how we do this, what, what, what I started out with, uh, so back in, the, uh, back in the late 90s when I was in Michigan, is I used Hubble Space Telescope. I used a lot of data from Hubble Space Telescope. Uh, and here are some images from Hubble Space Telescope with, uh, in the very central regions of galaxies. And what I'm, I'm doing is I'm, I'm taking a spectra of everything in here and seeing how fast everything is moving and you infer a black hole. You needed Hubble Space Telescope because you needed to get as close as you could to the black hole. So pre-HST, we had very few, a handful of galaxies had a suspected black hole after HST was launched, and one of the major reasons HST was launched, to get this really fine spatial information and then to help infer what the black hole mass. And it worked dramatically well. Okay, now we can do something different. We can use uh, ground-based telescopes with remarkable technology called adaptive optics. This is the Gemini telescope of which uh, a Canada owns a chunk of, and this is in Hawaii, and there's what you do, so the problem with, um, uh, with the ground-based telescopes is twinkle, twinkle, little star. The stars twinkle and they blur, the atmosphere blurs the image out a little bit. And so what you wanna do is take out that twinkle, twinkle, and you take a laser, a little more powerful than mine, and you, you, you shine it out from the telescope, 
it hits an upper, a layer of sodium, a really thin layer of sodium that's in our atmosphere, it bounces back down right into your instrument, and then you change the shape of your mirror to make that spot, to make that, that laser beam that's coming back in as much of a point source as you possibly can. And it works dramatically well. It turns ground-based observatories into space-based observatories. It takes out the atmosphere. For, for us, the atmosphere, for astronomers, the atmosphere is a major problem. Uh, there's just all this oxygen and nitrogen and that kind of stuff that gets in the way. Um, and, 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 and so that's what we do now. So all of the black hole game is on the ground-based observatories uh, because they have so much larger telescopes and can be much more powerful in terms of measuring those all black hole masses. This is um, an image, this is a, uh, uh, an artist's rendition of what it would look like near the black hole in M87. It's got a jet coming out and I hope that the folks from uh, University of Waterloo and the Perimeter Institute can image that someday and, and tell us that black holes um, are this point where there's this event horizon and we can actually use the word black holes with confidence. Right now it's just, you know, we don't know what else to call them. Okay, um, so what we did, what I did uh, some time ago is I, I measured as a bunch of black holes uh, and I plotted the mass of the black hole against the mass of the galaxy. This is a cartoon sketch and this is the actual data, okay? Uh, and it said, lo and behold, when, uh, when I did this, we, we had never expected to find, we just wanted them to measure the black hole masses, so that was our goal at the time. When we made that plot, we found a really strong relationship. That is, the bigger the galaxy, the bigger the black hole. And you say, well, that's not such a big thing, who cares about that? That's pretty easy. If you have a bigger galaxy, more junk, more stuff, it can fall into the middle of the galaxy, it can feed the black hole. If you have more material, more feeding material, that, then you would get a black hole, a bigger black hole. But was re, what was remarkable here was the tightness of the relationship. That is, with, with very high precision, if you told me the mass of the galaxy, I can tell you the mass of the black hole. If you told me the mass of the black hole, I can tell you the mass of the galaxy. That is what was a surprise. And that's what kind of caught us totally off guard. Uh, because almost, uh, when you make a galaxy, lots of stuff that happens that's really messy. You get, you get giant cloud collisions, you get smaller galaxies falling in, you get um, a weird type of morphology in galaxies that can, that can, that can move stuff around pretty efficiently. Um, and, and so to get something that, that, that is so tight between the mass of black hole and the mass of the galaxy, is a major clue that something is causing that correlation that is probably in the physical process that feeds the black hole and feeds the galaxy at the same time. And so, so just to give you the a basic theoretical idea, it's this whole concept of feedback. And this is, this is a very technical um, uh, a model, but it's, it's relatively easy to understand. That is, you get this big black hole sitting there. As you try to get material into that black hole, well, it just can't all make it in. You, you have a black hole that is relatively small compared to the size of the galaxy, and as you try to pile the material in, there's no way you can get so much material down into the black hole. So as you try to squeeze the material down, 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 it finds a weak spot and it basically, the material basically squirts out. And you often get, almost always get these beautiful jets, and then you get winds coming off the black hole as well. Okay, and the more material you try to squeeze in, the more powerful the jet, the more massive the black hole, the more powerful is the jet. Well, as those jets and winds come off, they're gonna slam into the material that you're trying to pile in. And so you get this, 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 this kind of trade happening there, uh, so between the mass of the black hole, because that produces all the energetics, the amount of, of, of material that comes off, uh, in, in terms of its energy, and the amount of material you're trying to dump in. And then you end up with this really nice relationship between the mass of the black hole and the mass of the galaxy. That's the basic idea of feedback, and um, um, so, so that's the basic process that happens there. Okay, and so that was the story for a long time. There was lots of theoretical papers trying to understand that, uh, and they began to uh, work quite well. And then we 
took more data and screwed everything up. So this is um, uh, the galaxy uh, NGC 1277. It's kind of a normal looking galaxy. Um, we've been doing a really major survey on the Hobby Eberly telescope, trying to find, our goal was to try to find the most massive black hole in the universe. Um, and, uh, and we did that by looking at the most massive galaxies. One of the reasons to find the most massive black hole is not just to be the biggest, but because it really pushes these ideas. For example, the feedback model, if you go to the really, if you, if you go to the most massive systems, they will have the most impact in terms of the energetics coming off, and so therefore they really test the model to its extreme. So we've been doing this big survey, and this one galaxy stood out in terms of how fast the stars were moving. The change in how fast they were moving from the outside to the inside of the galaxy was dramatic. And when we actually measured its mass, it was 20 billion times the mass of the sun. It was the most massive black hole to date. Now, I have had three or four press releases on the most massive black hole to date, because we, we find a more massive one every year. The universe is a big place, and so we keep on finding these, but this, but this still is the most massive, and it's way off this nice, beautiful correlation that we had where all these feedback models uh, uh, um, um, had been applied. And so that's, that's, that's a major problem right now. Uh, if we look at the full sample now, this is again that, that plot of the mass of the black hole and effectively the mass of the galaxy. We are beginning to populate this upper end with this survey. So our, our big HET survey, um, uh, uh, so uh, uh, our big sur survey on the Hobby Eberly Telescope, we are finding the most massive black holes out there. We have about between f about five galaxies now that are at this upper extreme end. And, and you know, we, we, we kind of have a, a saying down in Texas, and so, so even black holes are bigger in Texas. So, <laughs> sorry, sorry about that. Um, it works well. Okay, so what I want, what I want to do now is to talk about dark energy. So that's, that's, that's the black hole work, that's ongoing, and the Hobby Everly Telescope is doing some uh, fantastic stuff. And now I wanna talk a bit about um, a dark energy and what we're gonna do next with the Hobby Everly Telescope. So here is um, the Hobby Everly Telescope as it will appear probably in, uh, uh, in May of next year. This was, this was a project, I've been working on this project for 10 years, I had the idea about 10 years ago to do this. Uh, it's a $40 million project. I went to the director at the time uh, and he said, okay, let's go ahead and try to do this. Um, and that was, that, that was rough, because this was a working telescope that was producing remarkable data, remarkable results in many avenues of astronomy. And we, right now, took the telescope down. So right now, this telescope, this whole top end of the telescope has been taken off as of two weeks ago. It's, 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 it's off the telescope. We are going to replace it with a whole new top end of the telescope so we can do our experiment. I'll explain some of the instrumentation in a moment. And then what we're gonna do is we're gonna line these things with banks of spectrographs. And we call these things uh, saddlebags because we're from Texas. So we'll have these two giant saddlebags sitting on the side of the telescope and inside this, so inside the green cabling here, we have 33,500 optical fibers. You've probably seen optical fibers, um, uh, but what we're doing is we're, is we're gonna, we're gonna pave the focal plane of the telescope with optical fibers. The light comes in, bounces off the primary, bounces back up into our instrumentation, goes into one of the optical fibers, and through the cabling into our spectrographs, into our computer, and then we analyze it. Um, this is a project that was, you know, led and conceived at the University of Texas, and it's our instrument as well. Uh, Penn State is part of it, a uh, uh, Texas A&M is part of it, and then, um, and then a bunch of Germans are a part of it too. Okay, so what we do, um, this, is, this is how the universe expands, and um, pay attention because I am going to ask you about this at the end of, of, of the talk here. Um, but it's relatively simple. What I want to get to you is how easy it is to interpret this. And let me explain to you what, why, what we're doing. 
on this is telling us how the universe expands over time. We know that there's a big bang. That's, that's, that's the base model. And then from that, everything expands out. This number on the left is what we call the expansion rate. That is just a number of how fast you're going, how, fa how much you're increasing your velocity every second. That's just, that's the observation. This is the data, okay? That's the model of how fast the universe expands over time, okay? To understand that, and then, so, so, so on the left are the, are the observers, on the right are, I mean, it's a theory, are the theorists. And so to understand that expansion, it's relatively easy. You just got to ask yourself, well, what's in the universe, okay? There is light and there's radiation. And I'm putting up these numbers, so this, so this is the amount of radiation in a fractional contribution, and this is effectively time in the universe. So, we know that there's radiation in the universe, there's matter in the universe, there's the shape of the universe. I'm not gonna talk about the shape of the universe, but, the, but effectively all it is, is is the shortest distance between two points a straight line or not. Um, and so that, that, that's not that important. So there is radiation and matter. And what you do, what we did, say, 15 years ago, is we knew at that time that radiation is not a very important contribution now. We know that the shape is not a very important contribution now. And we measured that expansion rate. And then we knew an estimate of how much matter is in the universe, the amount of dark matter and the amount of normal matter. And what we did at that time, so this term had not existed 15 years ago, this added a term over here. So we knew this side, the observation, and we knew what that was. And it turned out that the side on the left was three times larger than the matter in the universe from that expansion. So the left side, it did not equal the right side. And there was a big, uh-oh, what do we do? And what we did is what you would do if you were in grad school and you really didn't know how to solve the problem. Well, you just add in a term. And, <laughs> and, and maybe the grader won't see it or pick it up. So that's what we did is we added in that term. That's not how I got to grad school. Um, so we added in that term, and, and, and I got to say, it is that blatant. It's that obvious, and, and the theorists can jump on me and say, no way, and I'll say, oh, sorry, you added in a term. So they, they added in that term, and we don't know where that term comes from. That is the problem. This is dark energy, and this, this, what dark energy is, and what I've always said is, it may not be dark and it may not be energy. It's just a phrase we use to reflect our ignorance of how the universe is expanding. And dark energy is kind of a nice word. It sounds cool, yeah, going after dark energy. But, but it really is, we don't know what's going on in the universe. It's because what we think is supposed to go on, that there's matter in the universe, we know how much, and we measure how much the universe expands, those two terms don't equal. What is surprising, though, is that this term is larger. And so what it means is that the universe has expanded more than what we thought. And this, and this is a fundamental problem. That is, you start out with the universe and it expands out from the Big Bang. You start everything at a very small point and it expands out. Well, as it expands out over time, the mutual gravitational attraction of everything in the universe should be causing it to slow down. Because gravity is is an attractive force, so it should cause things to slow down. But it's expanding out, uh, so as it expands out. But then when we go out and do the measurement, this ex not only are we expanding, but we're accelerating. The expansion, the, the rate at which the universe is expanding is increasing with time, and it, that rate should be slowing down. When they went out to do these measurements, they expected to measure a deceleration for how much it's slowing down, and that, and that will give you a lot of information on the amount of matter in the universe, but what they actually found was that it was being pushed apart. So what I, I didn't make there is as the universe evolves, properties are different in terms of what the matter is doing that will act in a different fashion as the universe evolves to how the dark energy evolves, to how the radiation evolves, to how the, the shape of the universe evolves. So having that baseline allows us to distinguish if, for example, um, a dark energy is a property of space, or dark energy is a property of changing uh, the gravitational uh, force law, or something else. It's, that, it's having, that, having the baseline where we're gonna get most of the information. Now, we know that 
This is a huge endeavor. There's lots of teams working on dark energy. We designed this whole experiment only to go after dark energy, but because we, we, we have such a big set of observations, we have enormous amounts of science potential here. And the ones I'm most interested in is trying to understand the most massive black holes in the universe. And the problem with, the mo with, with finding anything that's the most, that's that's extreme, the most massive, for example, they're very rare, that means they're very far apart, which means you need a huge survey. This is, this is an example of that will be like ancillary data that just falls out of there. Okay, so this is where we are. Uh, I say, you know, have a huge number of spectrographs, that's what we really need to do. That's the only way we're gonna to get to th this answer. Uh, and so right now, I, this, is, this, is, this is one of the most exciting parts of the project. We took the, it was so nice to take the telescope down. Uh, this is a, tel a telescope that's been working for 20 years, and we've had pretty much the same people running the telescope that whole time. And I, it, it, we didn't expect this, but they were so happy to turn this thing off and then to like basically take a sawzall to the top of this telescope and take the equipment apart. It just, it, it gave them so much pleasure because they've been struggling with this thing for so long. So they're all excited, we're excited. Uh, it was, I mean, I've been working on this project for 10 years. Um, uh, we should start taking data the mid part of next year and we'll know within a year what we have in the bag and, we'll, and then our full survey will end. Uh, in about uh, three or four years after that. So uh, stay tuned for that. I hope, you know, to come back and give you an update on the results there. Uh, and thank you for listening. Thank you, Carl. That was a great talk. And we have plenty of time for questions. Yes. I would have to go down there to explain it. I would have to go down there. Oh, you want to come down here? Okay. <laughs> wow, we're gonna let's let's hire him in a few years. First, could you write down the equation? <laughs> You can't remember the equation? Okay, let's, let's go back in here because I can't remember it either. So let me go back here. <laughs> Where is it? Here it is. There we go. It's that equation, right? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> sure. While you, he's calculating, we'll take another question. <laughs> yes. Uh, yes. How do you come up with the, with the initial image of the baby universe? That's a real image of the universe. That was taken by, the, uh, that image I showed was taken by the Planck satellite, and the previous one was taken by the WMAP satellite, and it's called the Cosmic Microwave Background. It's microwave photon, so they put a, a, a microwave antenna out in space, and then take an image of the, f of the full sky. That was the radiation that was, it's the earliest radiation that's released in the universe. And it's been traveling since for 13 and a half a, a billion years. So it's, it's an actual image of, of microwave photons, of the microwave what sky. Is that, what is that fingerprint Inside that is a fingerprint of how the matter is distributed. That's right. around the galaxy, it appears that it doesn't, it doesn't attract uh, itself the way real or normal matter does. Normal matter is clumped together into the galaxy and get more of a halo. Um, so we know that dark matter doesn't attract itself and it's attracted uh, okay, so, uh, so he asked an excellent question. Is, it's basically, why is the dark matter at the edge of the galaxy? Uh, why does it dominate at the, ex at the edge of the galaxy and the normal matter dominate in the middle is because they're, they're both attract to each other gravitationally. So the dark matter does clump. That's why it's clumped uh, uh, gravitationally. But what's special about normal matter is that it interacts with itself and it emits light. And so if two, two normal, two 
two particles that were normal matter hit each other, they would emit a, a radiation, they lose energy, and they fall towards the middle. And so the reason the normal matter is in the middle is because it interacted with itself, and then it fell down into the middle of the potential, whereas the dark matter doesn't interact well with, with, with itself or with normal matter, and so it stays at where it started out initially. All the normal matter was out there initially as well, but then it interacted and fell in. They, they're, all, they're all attracted to each other gravitationally, but it's just that the normal matter has this extra advantage where it can interact efficiently, lose energy, and fall towards the middle. So is yes, there there is a relation. So there, for a given a galaxy mass, all those galaxies tend to have a similar dark matter, uh, um, a similar a dark matter amount. It changes slightly from galaxy to galaxy, uh, depending on the mass. But they're they're in they're they're close to each other, and that number is about a factor of seven to nine. So that means dark matter is about seven to nine times more in terms of mass than normal matter. So we'll take one more while we still got it. Yes. How come you can't get out of a black hole? Okay, so he asked how come we can't make it out of a black hole? And the, the, the definition of a black hole is, is it's, it's, it has this event horizon, this, uh, the size of the black hole, where in order to escape from that black hole, from that event horizon, you effectively have to be traveling at the speed of light or faster than the speed of light. And since we know we can't do that, you can't escape out. The other idea, the, the, uh, um, um, the theory behind that is that space-time is curved in on itself. Space-time is a real entity, it's not a Star trek -y thing, it's a real mathematical entity and it's curved in on itself and so space is curved so much that you're effectively trapped inside that space. It's an interesting, yeah, okay, um, so, right, so black holes, yes, are increasing their mass over time. If you dump material into a black hole, it will just um, add to the mass of that black hole, and that it adds to the size of that black hole as well. And so, yes, we can actually calculate the, um, the growth rate of black holes over cosmic time if we wanted to, and people have done that. Um, and that correlates very well with actually how stars the amount of stars that are formed over time. And so that's, that, that's more evidence that whatever is causing the stars to form is related to how the black holes are formed. I don't think anyone has been bold enough to track black hole formation, the mass growth, with the, uh, with the dark energy expansion. So, um, um, and we, but it's, 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 it, it would be interesting just to make the plot and fun to make the plot. Dark matter is around four times, four to five times as much as normal baryonic matter. So why not an entire zoo of fundamental yes. particles? Yes. So he asked why, why is it just like a single fundamental particle? Why not a zoo of fundamental particles? That's much more than the normal. And, and yes, you're exactly right. And there are ideas out there for that as well. We like to keep things relatively simple, uh, that it's, it's one answer, it's one particle. And there are... Uh, a theory is that said if there's a whole zoo of particles, they will decay to uh, a stable particle anyway. But there are some theories out there which have a whole zoo of dark matter particles. That's for sure. Yes. Uh, on one of your slides, you showed a picture of the real universe compared to the simulation of the universe. If you look at the simulation, you have the galaxies, and then you have sort of webs connected to the galaxies. Yes. Where are those in the observation? 
Yes, uh, also excellent question. He asked about that comparison between the observations and the theory for how the galaxies are distributed. The problem with the theory is that they're too naive. Um, what you're looking at there is just the dark matter. What you're looking at with the observations is just the baryons. And so in order to make that, and okay, and, and in addition, when we look at the observations, we don't have a three-dimensional view, whereas we're in the theory, we, we know exactly where everything is, that's a theory, and so we can, we can, we can choose which galaxies to display um, um, through that three-dimensional cut. And so, it's, and so both of these things combine to make the observations messy and the theory clean. So you have to take that to count. And that, in fact, is one of the biggest problems when you compare the theory to the observations that one's looking at dark matter and one's looking at normal matter. And you need to know that relationship very accurately. Yes. Um, when you talk about, or you talked about uh, black holes, you said that it could be a form of exotic matter that we're not familiar with. Has any uh, energy been expended in investigating whether or not there's a link between that and dark matter, seeing as they both have a strong gravitational attraction with the other matter in the universe? No. Uh, so he asked it, uh, if there's a relationship between um, what is inside of a black hole and what dark matter is. We believe that. You did, well, no, is the answer. And it's, it's basically there, the scales are so different that it wouldn't make sense to compare the black holes on very small scales and the dark matter is distributed on very large scales. I mean, I, 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 I think I say no. <laughs> but I, I, I don't know exactly. <laughs> Okay, so right, so he's asking if they're if if they're around uh, if dark matter and dark energy is around uh, before the Big Bang, uh, or if they were around at the start of the Big Bang. So, at it, what comes before the Big Bang is we don't we don't we don't have any say in that. We we don't have any uh, uh, um, um, intuition, mathematical um, insight from what we know now to talk about what comes before the Big Bang, unless we talk about high, um, higher dimensions and multi-dimensions. Um, so whether, uh, so, so but, but, but we can ask, so was it there at the beginning? And the answer is we think so. And dark energy, for example, may be a property of space. And space, by definition, was there. And so therefore, dark energy would have been there. And dark matter uh, probably came along the same time all the particles in the universe came along. Um, okay, so there are, if, if dark energy is a property of space in terms of the cosmological constant, that model, then it, it, it has a specific uh, mathematical interpretation and it has, and we would measure, uh, um, uh, and we know what value we would measure for the expansion history of the universe. And so when we trace it, when we make that observation and trace out that expansion history, it has to match exactly what we would say from it being a property of space. That doesn't prove it's a property of space. Again, what science effectively is, is you know, you never prove that, that something exists, you just, you just prove that everything else is wrong. And so you're left with one thing standing. And so in this model, at least observationally, that would work. And then on the theory side, um, um, there, we are, I mean, there's a huge effort trying to make inroads into explaining the value of the cosmological constant. Uh, and if that works, and if the observations say it so, then I think we have a huge um, angle that that's probably what the answer is. Are we there? How are we doing? Okay. Forgetting about dark matter. Okay. The dark matter will slightly slow it down. So you'd have to take the, the dark energy and then subtract it by the by 
the strength of the dark matter. I'm glad. And here is going, and this is my diagram. So this, let's say, is the energy of the dark matter. And the lambda will be for the dark energy. Oh. The dark matter will actually slow down That's dark right. energy because one of them is what makes this happen. And the other makes This goes the other way. You're exactly right. So I'm glad, I'm glad you asked this question because it's going to allow me to clear something up. If you look up here at this equation, which is the same equation that you have here, this term here, this matter term, this matter term includes both normal matter, like you and I, and it includes dark matter. But normal matter doesn't have the same repulsion and, I mean, attraction as dark matter. So, so they, they be different, different things. They're not like the exact same thing. So normal matter and dark matter, you are right. They, they are different. They're different masses, but they're both attractive, and they both attract things gravitationally to each other. So they both act in the same well, sense. One of them makes a force similar to gravity, and the other just gets affected by gravity. Because one of them is like, it's like, it's like some sort of boat. <laughs> <That's> <laughs> You know, Waterloo is a town that's well known for its theorists. <laughs> we do argue here. <laughs> uh, so his question was, uh, uh, so in this term, so what happened to the dark matter? And uh, so, this, so this term here includes both the contribution of dark matter and normal matter. Uh, and, and we believe that what the dark matter is is just uh, it's just a fundamental particle um, uh, similar to normal matter in that it has mass, and so it, it, as long as it has well, mass, it's going to be attractive. Nothing, nothing ever seemed to hit it. Ah, because you're, there are, so just like uh, a proton and electron act differently, a dark matter particle will act differently f from then as well. That is a true fact. That is that that is true. We <laughs> excellent. That is <laughs> this. This is this. <laughs> <laughs> it's, no. It's, yes. no. You've done enough things. It was very good. That 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 is perfect. <laughs> I'm looking for a grad student. <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions? <laughs> so what steps are we taking to research um, a part a dark matter particle? Okay, so there are experiments ongoing, and uh, uh, so most of these are deep in mines. Oh, I should tell you a great story. Um, um, so the, they try to detect dark matter particles in mines because you have to shield it from interactions in the atmosphere on, uh, on Earth, and those particles that are made in the atmosphere on Earth are, sh are, are shielded by the, by the Earth, whereas a dark matter particle almost penetrates through everything. So you have these giant w water tanks in mines, and you have these very fine um, um, equipment in mines as well that you can detect a particle that actually <laughs> hits it. It's very sensitive. Now, my last time to Canada was about six years ago, uh, and I forgot my passport. I ran to the, the, to the airport, and I got to the airport in the US, and I said, oh, I forgot my passport. They said, well, we'll let you out of the US, but, uh, but good luck trying to get back in. So as I'm coming back in, the border crossing uh, says, well, where's your passport? I said, I'm an idiot. I forgot my passport. They go, go straight to the supervisor. I go straight to the supervisor. He asked me what I does. I said, I'm an astronomer. I had to pull the, the, the professor and the astronomer card at that point, and he goes, Tell me about these mine experiments where we're trying to detect a dark matter particle. And so for like 10 minutes, I explained it in detail, and he was so happy. He goes, OK, so you can go. So, so it's, that's how you get back into the US. And one of the biggest ones in Sudbury. 
Right. Yes. So there is the experiment AMS, which uh, AMS-2, which is on the space sh sh shuttle. Uh, it had a great press release last year that that um, argued it's uh, the inter the um, um, uh, the uh, uh, particles that you get when when two dark matter particles interact. It's the it's the it's the end product there. And so they argue that they see this 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 excess in this a type of muon, and that was indicative of dark matter. And they're taking more data now, and so that, that is a relatively exciting experiment, and that was a surprising result. So, yes? One more question. Yes. Um, so, going back to that thing, like basically using like the mines to detect these dark matter particles, it, was there a similar thing done to try to detect neutrinos? Yes, so uh, the, yeah. the Sudbury experiment was a famous one to try to detect the neutrinos coming off the sun and understand uh, how, how, how neutrinos are generated in the sun. No, so for a long time we thought that neutrinos were the solution to dark matter, uh, but they're not. They don't have enough mass to make up the solution for dark matter, and there's other properties which, if they were it, uh, so would be problematic. So we know that they're not the solution to dark matter, so it is a, it is a new type of particle. Yeah. Okay, so we haven't fed Carl since lunch, and I'm sure he's dying to get dinner, so let's thank him again.